the Climate Action Sheffield and uh, us at the Architects Climate Action Network. We have an exciting list of guest speakers for you this evening um, and we'll be hearing from a number of our existing student climate action groups across the country including students for climate action Sheffield, Newcastle and Westminster as well as guests uh, You Tell Me Collective and Decolonise Architecture. Thank you all for being here and giving up your evening. I'm Megan, I'm one of the uh, coordinators for ACAN Education and ACAN, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is a network of individuals within architecture and related built environment professions taking action to address the twin crises of climate and ecological breakdown. So thank you all for being here this evening after what has undoubtedly been a very busy and challenging uh, term in difficult times and during a week of warm weather. This event is a collective celebration of the incredible activism that's being undertaken by student-led climate action groups this year and a stock take of what's worked well and what hasn't, as well as next steps for the coming academic year. We'll be celebrating the work of both newly formed and well-established student groups and toasting you at our virtual pub, uh, The Hope and Action at 8 p.m. So, yes, welcome from us at Stucan Student Climate Action Network that was launched earlier this year in March. And here you can see an overview of ACAN's non-hierarchical structure, comprising thematic working groups, including ACAN Education, a core movement support group and a steering group. The Students' Climate Action Network, or STUCAN, is a new arm of ACAN Education, which seeks to increase climate literacy at all levels of higher education in the built environment. Our aims are to increase student agency, to unite student voices, and to thereby, thereby lead to a cultural transformation. The launch of STUCAN follows on from our earlier climate curriculum campaign, where respondents to our student survey felt that they were ill-equipped to mitigate the effects of the climate emergency in their future work, and the majority were unaware of any climate action groups within their institution. This word cloud was taken from our launch event back in March, following the question, uh, what is your personal emotional response to the climate and ecological emergency? We had an in interesting mix of emotions, ranging right the way from despair uh, all the way through to hope and frustration, urgency, overwhelming, anxiousness, everything that you can see here. And ever since then, we've been campaigning this year to increase the number of student-led climate action groups um, in built environment faculties across the country, supporting student, co student cohorts in schools of the built environment. In September of 2019, there were six groups of this kind, and there are now 25 plus across the UK, and we're spreading overseas. Um, so big, big improvement, and that number's growing rapidly. So you can find all of the information you need about STUCAN, uh, what you can do to help, how to form or join a student action group on our website, shown at the bottom there. We created a toolkit to help you get started, and you can also browse our uh, Padlet, which is filled with all of the resources that you'll need. You can find us on social media at architectscan underscore student. And if you're looking to form an action group at your university or want to discuss an upcoming idea uh, or an event, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Cool. Thank you very much for having me. And um, now I will be passing on to Helen from Westminster. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Helen, one of the founders of Westcan, which is the University of Westminster's Climate Action Network. Our action started in February after two of us joined the ACAN Education Group. We realized that we felt wildly unprepared to go into practice with our current knowledge of designing in the midst of the climate crisis, especially after five years of architectural education. Um, this is a screenshot of our first Westcan meeting. <laughs> we use the same Zoom etiquette as ACAN, which everyone enjoys, as you can see. Many of these faces and wavy hands are still active members now, and we have had our first in-person meetup this, meet this week, which was really fun. We started off by meeting with student reps of each design studio, asking them to spread the word to join us in our action. This was aimed at anyone and everyone, encouraging, encouraging students to have a voice in their education. We had goals and in initiatives set up to get people involved. This included voting on a name and our logo design competition. Our group follows ACAM's ethos as non-hierarchical and open to all, with a flexible workload to fit into the chaos of architectural life. Um, now I'll run through a few initiatives that we have done so far, starting with our logo design competition. We had loads of entries from students, but the one on the right got the most votes and won. 
We also voted on our name with West Ham being the winner. This was a fun icebreaker for the group to get involved and input into. Our weekly meetings were every Wednesday during term time. COVID meant that we couldn't see any other studios or year groups. So this was a great way to make friends and converse with other students virtually. We discussed initiatives, actions and ideas uh, on the weekly agenda and had smaller working meetings to focus on specific goals. One of these was dedicated to form a tailored response to the ARB's consultation on education in education institutions on fire and life safety design and sustainability. To educate ourselves, we had bi-weekly presentations and following discussions on topics such as the circular economy and embodied carbon, which were great to learn from and get to know our West Ham peers. Um, the university runs a students as co-creators initiative, which a group of us applied to collaboratively with two tutors as a West Ham research project. Um, this was called Climate Studio Sessions, and our research proposal tested a new format of lecture series where we had three speaker, speakers, breakout rooms to form a question in a group and a Q&A session, rather than the classic format of one speaker and a Q&A session. Our group thought that often students were not comfortable asking questions online and may come away with a from a lecture not knowing how to apply the knowledge to design studio work, especially with climate related lectures. We asked the same poll questions at the beginning and end of the session, which told us that people preferred our format over normal lectures, felt more likely to ask questions in the future and would like to see this format in future lectures. Um, our report will also be included in the RAPS Radicality 2021 conference in September. Um, a few weeks ago, we ran a cross-university debate with the Climate Action Group and Debate Society at the University of Manchester. Our topic was architecture won't be relevant on a dead planet and was really fun to organize along outside other students at Manchester University. Although it was less of a day and more of a discussion, it was a brilliant panel of speakers and collaboration of universities coming together online to discuss technical, technological, ecological and social topics surrounding the climate emergency. Uh, if you missed it, you can view it on the SUCAM website and we look forward to more cross university events in the future. Um, West Ham began conversations with the heads of year and educators at the university back in February. And since the university has launched its own climate action task, task force set up and led by Director of Research, Professor Lindsay Bremner. This is available to join for both educators and students with four individual working groups that targets four areas of action within the university. We are extremely excited to work alongside the educators at Westminster and see action from within the uni to make architectural education more climate literate. This leads on to what comes next for us over summer and next year. Alongside taking action as a student voice in the Climate Action Task Force, we want to encourage students to join West Ham from the get-go in first term. We have proposed to hold a UK-wide climate assembly at Stukan Universities in the coming months, so watch this space along with the other climate action groups for what comes next. Thank you. Amazing, Helen. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. And it's incredible to see how much um, West Can have taken just in the short uh, period of time that you've been formed. Uh, I'm now going to take the opportunity uh, to introduce Vinny from uh, Newcastle. And yeah, we're about to hear what those guys have been up to this year. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us along today. Uh, it's really great to be uh, invited along such inspirational speakers uh, and groups. Uh, we're really excited to share what, what we've been up to and what our aims are uh, coming up. So we are NCAM, Newcastle Students Climate Action Network. We're a group primarily of MR students here at Newcastle who started meeting together in January with hopes to expand and become a representative body of the whole architecture school here. We want to use our agency to promote intersectional and positive solutions, celebrating the great work that students are doing that sometimes gets lost in design projects and other architectural work. We feel that collective action will bring around positive and meaningful change, but we aim to put pressure on the architecture school here to bring about the change that we need. We wanted to do something in the face of the climate crisis, but also do something fun uh, together on Zoom uh, that wasn't a tutorial or another quiz. We were, we were also keen to be part of the emerging network of student climate action groups here in the UK and abroad. But we noticed that there was little representation in the north and none at the time in the northeast of England. Now there's ourselves and NUCAN, Northumbria's Climate Action Network, who are aim on, aiming to develop close ties with. 
Our first challenge was working out what we wanted to do with the group. Uh, we found that coming up with what we wanted to stand for was, was actually quite hard. We wanted the group to be fluid, a constant evolution of ideas, something personal and representative of, uh, of Newcastle students telling our stories and frustrations uh, and our passions. Uh, but we're keen to provide a platform for students to voice themselves in creative ways, using our positions as designers to think optimistically and exploratively of the ways to combat the climate crisis. We're hoping that our passion and optimism will define our voice here at Newcastle. Uh, though I was aware that personally I hadn't engaged with the climate crisis at all really in my previous work and we hope to, to highlight where we thought our skills were lacking and our desire to, to, for more knowledge and teaching on ecologies and sustainability. So we proposed the creation of a reflective document that looks back at some of our work and projects in a, in a more critical light. Each slide took the piece of work and we started to ask questions of it and ourselves incorporating the research we've done on that topic. The aim is that we can transform this into a continuous piece of creative practice a blog that will be updated with new members work, current news and some of the great work going on in the community. Hopefully we'll see a progression as ours and the school's climate literacy improves, showing where we've been going and, uh, and what, what, where we have been. We hope that it can be designed in a way that challenges hierarchy and gives everyone an equal voice. When it came to starting up the group, we were aware that it was primarily our small M arch bubble. We knew that would like as many people across the school to be involved. And although we've, we found it quite hard to expand outside of it just being mass of students, we've uh, developed the beginnings of a cross year student group. Uh, we currently have at least one member from each year, which we, we feel quite proud of. Um, so we've set up our social media pages on Instagram and Twitter to try and build those connections and inform about what we've been doing. We also launched our group live on YouTube as a interactive workshop from other students of the school to get involved in. It was great because we could do it as a group, but then also meet potential new members. Uh, we might not be looking like we're having a lot of fun in this photo, uh, but I promise you that we, we were. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, some, an event that we also put questions to the new recently appointed climate literacy tutors here at Newcastle. Um, it's their job to steer the school's curriculum and we hope that our students will be able to provide them with ideas and, and a voice really for, for that change. Um, in terms of our, our ambitions for the for the future, the short term and the long, uh, we're looking to make our group last really. Um, a few of our core members are graduating this summer and we're keen to be able to pass on the even though short period of learning we have had uh, onto the, the future generations of the group. Uh, and although it's sometimes been hard to galvanise support across the school, there is there is some, some great work going on and we, we want to hope that our platforms can provide a, a voice for that. Uh, and then allow people to, to join as well. We've started making links across the university and Newcastle, which we hope to develop more. And we've talked with a range of university student groups and students union initiatives, which we hope to run joint workshops for in the future. We're also aiming to set ourselves up as a full student society so that we're able to use the funding to put, put on bigger and better events. Um, and then we're also looking to become involved in the curation of our degree show here in Newcastle forefronting sustainability and student action. Uh, so I'll, I'll sign us off there, but we're really excited to, to be involved in this uh, network of climate action groups and seeing where it goes in the future. Uh, so thank you very, very much tonight. And I look forward to hearing from the other speakers later. Thank you. Thanks very much, Finney. What a great presentation uh, again. And it's amazing to see the work that you're undertaking already. Um, we love what you're saying about ambitions and it sounds like you're being proactive and uh, ensuring that it sort of carries on from year to year. So that's great. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce um, Elle from uh, Students for Climate Action Sheffield. Hi. Um, yeah, hi everyone. My name's Ellie um, and I'm part of Students for Climate Action here at Sheffield School of Architecture. Um, we're really excited to be here today and to be kind of hosting Shukan. It's great to have heard from West Can and NCAN, and I hope you're all really excited to hear from our guest speakers a bit later on. Um, I joined our group at the start of this year, and I'm really excited to talk to you today about what we've been up to. So some of the great events and resources that we've put out and some of the challenges that we faced over the past year. Um, so our group was created in October 20. 
2019 with seven people, and this has now grown to over 30 regular members. The team is broken up into several working groups with events, social media, website resources, communications, and the podcast team. Each of these groups meet weekly or fortnightly, depending on workload. We have a weekly team meeting, which allows for working group representatives to report back what is going on within their group, which also allows for cross working group collaboration, for example, between events and social media to make sure that our events are advertised and so that we can get all of our um, everyone in the group working together. We um, in putting together this presentation, we actually asked our group kind of what they thought of our group structure and how things went. Um, where it went about and we got some feedback so having a really clear structure is really important in helping us expand so quickly it's meant that new people coming in can work out where they fit really quickly and start making a contribution and it's been really important to us similar to what Vinny said making sure the group contains a range of years or courses which creates a range of thoughts and voices and we can understand what's happening across the school so right from events that are going on in first year put on by the school all the way up to year six M March. Some of the kind of the negatives of our group structure at the moment that we're working on are we have a tendency to focus all of our energies onto one thing at a time, which means we don't always pursue everything we could. So next year we're looking to kind of work out how we can divvy up work a little bit better and make sure that we can properly respond to all of the different things going on. And also we could work harder to make sure the working groups are a little bit more linked to feel like one single group. This kind of links into yeah, our next slide with working within COVID. So because we haven't been able to meet up in person, it's meant that everything's felt a little bit separate. Um, we've managed to increase the group significantly, working with staff and students all across the world to gain momentum within the school. Uh, when our meetings were taking place in person, most people who joined our group were from studios and just from kind of word of mouth. But now it means that we can have a broader range of students involved. We've also been able to be really flexible with our meetings so to host them in the evenings to suit more people's schedules. But because of work from home, some of us have only managed to meet in person um, a couple of weeks ago for the first time, which was, I'm sure everyone else has experienced really a little bit strange. Um, we tried really hard to keep morale high through the year, but it was really difficult seeing each other only during working group meetings. It felt like the group was very businesslike and very formal. Um, and hopefully having more face-to-face -face contact next year will improve the group dynamic and mean we can all interact a little bit better. So in spite of all of this, we have still managed to put on a bunch of exciting events this year, from social media campaigns to hosting events and sharing resources. Um, so last year we conducted a school-wide survey to gain an understanding of how many students want the school to do more to embed sustainability in their architectural education. Um, and that's part of the ACAN starter pack. The social media team have done a really good job to give a voice to these students by sharing the results of the survey on our rapidly growing Instagram page. And we took part in the campaign earlier in the year where we were sharing our sustainability resolutions with the world. Um, our events team, most of our events were organised online this year, bringing possibilities of engaging a large audience to participate. Our climate emergency design charrette was part of a week of planned events where the brief was to envisage a positive future for one of three locations in 2080. And we're supposed to have some lovely images of Lake Como, Sheffield and Shanghai here, but they haven't come up in the presentation. Um, but this event, gave students a chance to really think outside the box in terms of design for the future climate and it was without the pressures of studio so it was just an afternoon where we could really just expand our ideas and think about possibilities for the future where we didn't have to worry that actually these things were going to be marked by our studio tutors and it was really liberating just to have that freedom the feedback also indicated that the participants really enjoyed working in teams and collaborating with other years and departments within the school. Our survey demonstrated that students at Sheffield feel the resources for development of climate literacy are not signposted well enough by the department. We created a resource library to demonstrate this gap and to show what it could be filled with. We support students in their independent learning about sustainability by creating an online resource bank, 
with books and podcasts available to all students. We've also started a podcast this year where our podcast team interviews staff and students to start interesting discussions. We're excited to keep moving forward as a group over the summer and into next year. We're organising a climate forum later this month to continue to give students a voice. It will be a chance for staff and students to join together to discuss how we can centre sustainability at the heart of the curriculum on a level platform. We're working with a recently formed staff climate action group at the school to organise this event, which is really exciting. One of the challenges that we face moving forward, though, is defining our relationship with this group to ensure we can continue to put pressure on the school, but to work collaboratively with the staff. After the initial push to put out our survey last year, we've had to really consider how we can stay campaign focused as the group expands. We really enjoy putting on lectures and providing resources for students, but our underlying aim is that the school takes on these responsibilities. We're entering a new phase of climate action group, how we try to talk to staff and build a relationship with the school, but still be critical. One of the biggest challenges that we all face as individuals within the group is keeping up with the work we're doing for students for climate action, as well as staying on top of our coursework. We've all had to learn how to manage our time really effectively over the year, especially being online where it feels like you could just work for hours and hours and there's almost no off switch. But we continue to be part of the climate action group because in spite of the challenges we face, our group continues to contribute towards real change within the department. Given all we've achieved in the last two years, we're really excited to see what year three brings. Thank you all for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the speakers. Thank you, Ellie. What a great presentation. And uh, yeah, we're excited to see what you bring in your third year as well. Um, really great to hear some of the challenges that have been presented to you, uh, COVID and homeworking, and obviously a group that was formed during face-to-face -face times uh, before COVID. I think you're one of the only ones that we've heard from who have had to navigate that, that shift. So really great to hear. Uh, so we're going to go into a breakout room in a moment. We, uh, because we're a little bit ahead of schedule, we thought we might just do little recaps for the facilitators that maybe wanted to, yeah, just discuss what happened in their breakout room. Uh, and I just picked on that. But now we had we had students from Cambridge, uh, Norwich, Manchester, Bath, Sheffield. Okay, I, if I miss someone out, I'm really sorry. Um, but um, it was it was really good to kind of hear from the different all the different perspectives um, and kind of some of the things that we've done is kind of like a focus on materials in studio. Um, both as like the impact of the materials themselves and also kind of towards wider behaviour change encouraged by awareness um, on the materials. And then also quite a lot of the student groups are focusing on the um, curriculum. And one of the points that was made was when you're interacting with tutors, um, again, how is that dynamic in terms of putting pressure on the tutors, but also and, and the staff in terms of um, you know, kind of changing, but also making sure that they also haven't been educated and it's not their fault or anything. So it's kind of working collaboratively as well and trying to get that dynamic right. Um, so yeah, that was another thing that was discussed. Um, that was kind of one of the things that was um, partly challenging. Also engagement, um, it's kind of difficult to keep engagement up throughout the year, um, especially depending on the unit size, because um, you could potentially have some core members which are attending, but how do you make sure everyone um, feels involved. Um, and then some kind of ideas around networking. Um, I think Sean raised um, the idea of some kind of thematic um, events between the different student groups um, over the um, next semesters where we might bring um, students together on a specific topic, whether that's curriculum, um, maybe it's something with mental health within um, the schools as well, and to kind of have that perspective as well. Um, and then Marion talks about how, because we've now got student groups in pretty much every ROVA area, how we can also, as well as looking nationally, we can focus on the specific regions um, as well. Uh, does anybody else want to discuss or go next in terms of, yeah, any of the facilitators want to talk about what happened in their breakout room? So in our breakout room, we, uh, I guess we did like you know, quite a few from different unis and also covering both student and staff. So that was quite good. Uh, we just kind of talked about like the disparity sometimes um, and how it is good to have that um, like communication between both staff and students trying to get that sometimes uh, can be a bit challenging and also I guess it widens the focus which 
is really good, but maybe that's one of the obstacles to trying to narrow it down and try and get actions um, like agreed and addressed. And that was yeah a good point that was made about maybe as well as focusing on like the bigger picture that sometimes you can miss the smaller wins, which is a really good statement that was made. Even things like material choices for like printing and recycling materials or model making. So yeah, to tackle it at all scales. Uh, and I guess another thing that also came out was um, so next year was maybe yeah collaboration was again kind of key about how could we kind of arrange for more events like intra university events like the Westminster Manchester debate that we had earlier, which went I think really well. Um, and either just connecting people of similar groups, because uh, we talked about like Edinburgh, for example, that there was um, a student who was going to be interested in starting a group, but then people in a university maybe don't know who else is interested. So it'd be quite interesting for us to kind of see how we can yeah, connect students maybe who, don't, who aren't aware of other students interested in forming a group or yeah, just connecting people in general. So I think that's an action for us to maybe come back to. Um, but yeah, be a, a good discussion, I think, all around. Would anybody else like to briefly discuss their breakout room? Yeah, maybe I can. Um, yeah. In our group, it was mainly people from Sheffield, um, both from architecture and from a sustainable course. So it was interesting to see how the two are together. And um, we also talked a lot about collaboration and how um, with being online, it was a bit difficult. And also how like people are not aware of even another course in the university and how it would be better to, or like um, we could try somehow to integrate or like uh, connect people. Um, and also there was a point about even between staff, sometimes there was not effective communication. Um, yeah, and there was a good point made about maybe if we change the language around climate emergency from something negative to um, maybe thinking about the future to be an, like an inspiring future, that would be um, maybe, yeah, like people maybe would feel inspired to join it more. And I think that was maybe something we could also do in our social media or how we um, do things. Great, thanks a lot. I don't know, would anybody else like to go? Yeah, we just talked a bit about um, getting students involved and like how it's quite difficult to set up a group when um, if students aren't willing to kind of do that, um, especially when it's in like first year and everyone's quite busy and stressed with like architecture. Um, and then, yeah, like not only learning about the climate crisis, but learning that students have the like a lot of agency um, and teaching them that they have the power to change things if they want to. Um, and then we talked a bit about um, integrating the courses and how um, educators received our like the students sometimes and whether they were like happy to listen to us or um, not and yeah and then we discussed um, a bit about history and theory and like how it, that it could be integrated and like what's happening at our different unis but yeah we only had three of us um, but we had a really good conversation about those things. Great. Anybody I'm, happy, I'm happy to chip in. Go, go. Um, yeah, I had a great discussion with everyone in breakout room too. We were talking right up to the minute, so I just want to say thanks, guys. It was a really great discussion. And we had a mixture of people in climate action groups and not climate action groups. Um, a main theme that was coming across is kind of like exposure and there being so much stuff offered to us, you know, like lectures, resources, and those also those not being centralized, but also like the sheer volume of them and how to wade through and prioritize what you should be looking at and maybe not feel like you have the guidance to do that. Um, and then also just the overwhelmingness of the challenge of being a student climate action group. What do you tackle first? How do you tackle it? Um, and that is just probably an ever, I mean, anytime you try and tackle a big issue like that, it's, you know, that that is the challenge and it, um, and it's quite hard to avoid, but like it's, it's definitely a feeling when you set up a climate action group. How, how do you tackle such a big issue? Um, a really interesting point that was brought up is about part three. Um, I don't see part when we've been talking about these things, part three doesn't often pop up in the curriculum of what is in the part three. Um, and sustainability apparently isn't being as addressed as it could be or like not addressed at all at part three. So I think that is maybe an area as a group we could maybe expand a bit, just our thinking. Um, 
in terms of what Stukan could do um, and what we could all do as climate action groups, um, you know, a lot of groups are coming to the end of the first year and I think that any skill sharing that we can continue to do in a more informal way would be brilliant. Um, you know, like passing on like tips about social media, how to negotiate handovers, how to set up good constructive dialogues with staff. Um, yes, I think there's like, informal things we can do over the summer, um, but yeah, really interesting. So we're gonna be taking a quick break now um, and then coming back together for um, about five past seven, where we're gonna be hearing um, from You Tell Me Collective, followed by Decolonize Architecture. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to hear from everybody else who's yet to speak before moving on to um, hearing from uh, Zafir, who's gonna chat about the um, ACAN thematic working groups as an introduction to the goings on at ACAN um, as well as ACAN education. Um, something that's come up in the past at meetings is it's nice to feel that you can sort of explore new topics that you don't yet have knowledge on. Um, and hopefully today we can make those a little bit more welcoming um, and feel like you can join any of the working groups at ACAN. Hey, welcome back everybody um, to the second part of this session. Um, and it is, yeah, now my pleasure to pass over to Ella from You Tell Me Collective, who's gonna run us through um, yeah, a little bit about them, what they've been up to. So I'm Ella Prokkola uh, from Finland and I'm representing the You Tell Me Collective today. And it's really exciting to, <laughs> to be here. And yeah, I will do a bit of a recap of the work that we have done for the past two years. So I actually just today noticed that we are on this uh, map <laughs> of uh, student action climate groups. So this like lonely dot <laughs> in Finland is the uh, You Tell Me Collective. So yeah, to give you a bit of a context, we are a group that is uh, based in, in Helsinki, uh, Finland. Uh, Finland is a country uh, which has three architecture schools, so a bit less than in UK. <laughs> uh, and we have also 3,000 architects, so the field of architecture is a bit smaller, well, a lot smaller than in, in UK. So we feel that the uh, society and the context where we operate is is a bit different, but it might also be a bit easier to get our voices heard. Mm, yeah, we are a small core group. It's a bit like fluid and organic how we how we organize ourselves, but we are mostly uh, master students that will will soon graduate. And yeah, we've been organizing projects where where students can uh, can attend, so they can uh, join or leave how they feel. But maybe the core group is is uh, seven people at the moment. I think our our activity started uh, two years ago. I feel like it was summer 2019 when we were planning our first event, uh, which was really based on this kind of mutual frustration that we were all feeling that there is something not quite correct in our own education and we would like to do something with this and that's how we came up with uh, an idea for a symposium or a seminar where we would invite like-minded people to discuss how the profession how our future career should be shaped and in November 2019, the first uh, You Tell Me Symposium took place in, in Helsinki. And we felt uh, it was a success. Uh, we were, were really happy with the feedback and the level of engagement from, from people. And that's how we decided that we will we want to continue and make something, something reg, uh, regular and yeah, from these, these meetings. And then in uh, 2020, we started organizing uh, evening schools that were meant to, uh, to kind of enhance the uh, discussion culture among 
among students and young architects around the topics of, of climate crisis and other, other important topics of our era. And the aim of the evening schools was that we want to give students a chance to uh, bring their own topic and curate their own discussion. And this was the, the aim from the, from the start of the evening schools to really like give, give students a chance to uh, bring, up, bring up some topics that are maybe not, not addressed in the formal uh, university uh, education. Mm. So yeah, and this spring, our uh, focus has been especially education. We have organized this uh, education series because we felt that to kind of to make a change uh, in the field, in our current position, we are we are able to uh, work uh, inside the university system as students. So during the spring, we have really in evening schools uh, tried to figure out how, what is the climate curriculum that would be needed in this era and what is needed to achieve uh, this change in our education. And also uh, Aiken visited our evening school uh, this spring. So it was a great uh, start for collaboration. Mm, and also like as part of the, the uh, education project, we carried out this survey that is based on the uh, Stucan survey. So we modified it a bit, translated it and gave it to the students of Alto University to answer. And I won't go too much into detail of the, of the results, uh, but just mainly I would say that in general, uh, people felt or students felt that in the beginning, beginning of the uh, studies in the in the in the bachelor studies, there could be more room for for like profound uh, teaching and like uh, tackling the the questions regarding climate crisis. Mm, yeah, and based on this survey, uh, we came up with a few uh, a few proposals and few, like a few results, like how the how we could move towards like a more climate literate uh, architecture education. Uh, and we felt we feel really strongly that in our current um, education, we cannot add up a lot of more workload into the diploma. So we have to make changes in the in the existing courses. And based on the feedback we got from the students, we we proposed that whether the like creative freedom that is given in the beginning of the studies, that this freedom uh, and this kind of uh, time for play could really be used to create like visions for ecological transition, which is a task that really uh, requires uh, time and imagination. So maybe like the beginning of architecture studies could be could be a good place for this. And then just in general, uh, it's really really we felt it's really important to critically. Uh, examine how we talk about materials, how we discuss their impact, and is it clearly communicated for for all the students? Like how how the use of materials is going to uh, impact? Yeah, mm, and then just like maybe maybe a general point also about our thoughts based on the survey would be that it would be super important to uh, emphasize the environmental impact of the choices choices that are made by architects in their work. Mm. Uh, as I said, uh, Finland is a bit smaller country and it might be a bit easier to get your voice heard, but we were still quite surprised that we got uh, invited to speak in the seminar of the Finnish Architects Day, which is like the main event 
uh, of of Finnish architects, and so we uh, we showed we discussed about the education and our, our survey results, and also um, so we had a chance to kind of publish publish our work in this event. Mm, yeah, and then something some more projects that are not related to the evening schools also we are trying to uh to kind of uh, talk to the wider public not just for students or professionals uh, but one of the campaigns we did was about bringing to to the public space these statements about the current way of of our construction culture uh to help uh help people to understand like what is the like environmental environmental impact of our current uh, construction culture yeah and then also we have been active in just like uh, participating the the uh, discussion the, in media by writing and it has been a good way for us to get our voice heard mm. The kind, kind of the latest project that we've been uh, participating has been a really nice um, uh, initiative by the Finnish Architecture Museum, uh, Fill This Space Summer School, which is intended for for 16 to 20 year old uh, young young students that are not yet in the in the field or in the studies of architecture, but who are inter interested in the topics. So we are we are carrying out these uh, like short summer schools, and maybe uh, we are able to uh, give them kind of kind of perspective to to the uh, work of architect architects in a way that we we would like the work to be. Mm, for example, today this is a a picture from today when we visited uh, this like Helsinki uh, Biennale, uh, which is really like tackling uh, with uh, with the but yeah with the means of art uh, the questions of of climate crisis. And maybe to just conclude, uh, nowadays we feel like we are not alone <laughs> in Finland anymore. Uh, there are a lot of collectives. And groups that are kind of working, working with the with the same topics. And this spring, uh, Aiken Finland was founded, and we are really happy to have all these allies, uh, both in Finland but uh, also internationally, that we can always refer to, and feel like we are part of this momentum. Yeah, and that's everything for me. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Ella, for a fantastic presentation. Um, so amazing to see what you've been up to and the uh, steps you've taken so far. And um, yeah, hopefully next year you won't be over there as the only pin that we have uh, in Europe. It'd be nice to see some more action groups pop up. Um, it's now time uh, to introduce Tanya and Jasmine um, from Decolonize Architecture. Thank you, Elle. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate being part of this talk so far, uh, seeing what all the other student groups have been doing is really inspiring. Um, so I'm here just to talk a bit about Decolonized Architecture, um, a student and alumni group formed at the University of Bath, our activities, and also even further how um, uh, climate action, activism, and decolonization are inherently interlinked. Uh, so, in terms of who we are, uh, we have a committee that facilitates different aspects of our work. Uh, so there's Charlie and I who are coaches, Jasmine, uh, who's also presenting today, who is uh, events manager, Mohit and Flora are in uh, kind of coordinate graphics and social media and Harsha um, liaises with our architecture uh, library kind of our architecture library <laughs> librarian. Um, so how we started was last year in June 2020, um, there was a uh, open letter to our 
director of studies and the head of department that got over 200 signatories that was calling for um, essentially acknowledgement and change within the department in terms of institutional racism, um, what exactly that is and what students would like to see improved. Um, and then further from that, that um, established our action points and um, also kind of kickstarted our first anti-racism forum that we had on the 9th of July, 2020. Um, so in terms of our action points, they're split up into three different sections. Um, so if I just fix my screen. Uh, so we have a focus on environment, particularly um, kind of the main concerns that were raised in our anti-racism forum that um, had students kind of as the main characters and the tutors were invited to be listeners. Um, one of the concerns was that there was not enough language or the ability to talk about different instances that people may have felt were either institutionally or overtly discriminatory. So um, it's kind of a case of wanting more um, equality and diversity training so that uh, home and visiting tutors know kind of what microaggressions are, how to properly address students, um, resources um, that enable students to educate themselves on their own architectural narratives, um, students who don't come from perhaps Western European or um, kind of the uh, more commonly taught uh, Japanese architecture that we're taught, you know, how can they relate to their own idea and upbringing with architecture? Um, and then furthermore, presentation. So um, how exactly are we talking about um, different social issues and how is that presented in our design briefs? Um, and then also we have um, a case of diversity needed. So looking at statistics, seeing why is there an acceptance gap in our department in terms of ethnicity? Why is there an attainment gap? Um, why are students from different de uh, demographics dropping out? And how can we improve the environment so that people can feel that this is the uh, department for them? And then quite importantly, curriculum. So making sure that we're actually efficiently taught about social issues such as more details on um, gentrification and um, how exactly to analyze the sociological aspect of sites rather than just the physical and uh, geographical. Um, so yeah, onto the next slide. Uh, we have a case of how does decolonized architecture relate to climate change? Um, so overall developed nations typically have high or higher carbon dioxide emissions per capita while some developing countries lead in the growth rates of carbon dioxide emissions. These and even contributions to the climate crisis are at the core of the challenges the world community faces in finding effective and equitable solutions to global warming. There is a need to promote emerging diverse and multifaceted platforms of building practices to combat the challenges of the climate emergency. Um, so overall colonization goes all the way back to the 17th century um, at the start of the enlightenment that essentially had philosophers center whiteness as the default form of humanity. And that was also the boom era of exploration or colonization. And so those who would explore to other nations would bring those ideals of whiteness with them. And furthermore, they'd also bring their own ideas of gender and um, agriculture and how to treat the environment, therefore kind of essentially committing ecocide within those communities. And so um, this was the forefather of modern day capitalism and even to a further extent, um, current corporations that have neo-colonial practices. Um, and therefore this narrow and narrative was used as a political tool within architecture. Um, and it's kind of important to explore architecture as a technology, I would say over it as a narrative um, in order to kind of approach it more sustainably um, because that involves practices such as biomimicry within the nature of that um, context as well as the culture. Um, natural forms and materials, calculating carbon emissions and designing with energy conservation in mind rather than um, kind of, you know, destruction. Um, and these practices can manifest in passive house building, carbon mapping, bioengineering, um, kind of a technological system that relies on engineering problem solving that is appropriate to the context that it's in. Um, and so I kind of wanted to talk a bit about intersectional environmentalism um, in terms of modern day activism. 
Uh, just to kind of give a definition of what that is, it was first used by the activist Benjamin Chavis in 1982 and described as racial discrimination in environmental policy making. So the enforcement of regulations and laws, the de deliberate targeting of communities of color to toxic waste facilities. So for example, the poison tap water in Flint, Michigan, which is a majority black community. Um, and the history of excluding people of color from the leadership of ecology movements. Uh, so examples of this can mean, can result in toxic waste dumps in the lower Rio Grande Valley. And also um, within China, where 80% of children have been poisoned by old computer parts within a specific town in China, not the whole country. <laughs> um, so why must we decolonize education? Um, so it's kind of a, I guess, architecture often pr uh, promotes or promises a case of inclusivity and serving community. And, and in order to, for it to do that in practice, it needs to be that in education. So kind of analyzing the current um, institutionally racist structure we have, deconstructing that and rebuilding that with more inclusive practices um, and making sure that we address power imbalances um, in terms of students and staff. Um, so overall, kind of to conclude my section, um, how can, environmentalism in education be intersectional. So a couple of points could be designed to avoid worsening air quality to lift the inequitable health burden of air pollution, um, have clean energy and clean economy um, be accessible to all and provide spaces for women of color and um, overall people of color within architectural leadership of the sustainability movement and plan for the future. Now over to Jasmine. Thanks Tanya. Okay, um, so another aspect of colonialism, uh, which is having an impact, especially obviously in the Middle East, uh, is this uh, vision of modernity that seems to have been adopted. Um, and essentially a key driving factor for a lot of developing nations, uh, such as the United, United Arab Emirates, is the desire to become established uh, with what is perceived to be contemporary and emerging in comparison to these Western ideals. Um, so of course, Dubai is a paragon of this, and it currently ranks as fourth in the world for cities with a great number of skyscrapers, uh, with 215 buildings over 150 meters tall. And to put this into context, that's fourth after New York, which has 297 skyscrapers. Um, and of course, the key difference between these cities is their climate zones, but when it comes to striving for that contemporary vision, uh, as you can see on the slide here, uh, this some, seems to be something which is often disregarded or at least not put at the forefront of design as we're so often taught. Um, so I found this quite funny when I came across this article about the Burj Khalifa, um, and it just seemed to really some that kind of idea that if you put solar panels on it, it means it's sustainable, which of course, hopefully we all know, <laughs> isn't really the case. Um, so yeah, the Burj Khalifa is for Dubai fame uh, as the tallest building in the world since its construction in 2010. Um, and Dubai are currently constructing yet another skyscraper to beat this record. Um, and yeah, this article basically is arguing that it's one of the greenest buildings in the world because the solar panels, um, there's so many of them that they can power up with the water heating in the building and also the water from the air conditioning units is recycled for irrigation. Um, but of course, we know that uh, glass buildings in a tropical desert climate zone uh, will obviously lead to overheating. And of course, um, this will create a huge demand for energy uh, for these air conditioning units. Um, so really this kind of leads us to question what is sustainable um, beyond just simple material efficiency um, and that building sustainably shouldn't just be a simple fix or something which you add on after, um, but actually should be integrated into the actual art of the architecture. Um, so similarly, Hong Kong is actually located within a subtropical climate zone. Um, and yet yeah, is ranked as number one in the world for cities with the most skyscrapers um, with like 482 buildings over 150 meters in height. Uh, and these reflective surfaces, uh, the tall structures and this level of hyper urbanization 
uh, all contributes to what we call the urban height, um, the urban heat island effect, uh, which drives up soaring temperatures within the city. Uh, so for context, July 2020 was recorded as Ho Hong Kong's hottest month since records began. And uh, the residents have actually been told to expect highs of 40 degrees this summer, uh, which obviously you can imagine will only get hotter as uh, the years go on and the urbanization increases. Um, so one of the things that we like to try and advocate for at Decolonize Architecture is learning from the vernacular. Uh, of course, this isn't always applicable in every scenario, um, but we strongly believe that local problems will have local solutions and that we should try and learn from the past. Um, so what you can see here on the left is in the more rural areas of China, uh, the Yaodong dwellings are traditionally carved into the hillsides. Uh, which make use of the cooling properties and the thermal mass uh, that the earth provides. Um, and over time, these have actually evolved into masonry dwellings, uh, which usually share at least one face uh, with the hillside. But because of urbanization and this strive to be what's considered as modern, a lot of the newer constructions have become these kind of concrete flats um, in an attempt to kind of mimic the Western world, uh, which aren't actually uh, culturally or climatically appropriate. Um, so yeah, what we can see on the right here is an example of how we can actually learn from this vernacular. Uh, and this was a winner of the 2006 World Habitat Awards. Um, it was uh, a thousand sustainable dwellings constructed uh, in the lowest uh, plateau of China, which was in inspired by this vernacular you can see on the left. Um, and it was a self-build project, which was meant to encourage awareness of the land, uh, environmental conservation, and also to enforce that idea of continuing the traditional construction skills um, and make sure that these are kind of passed on to younger generations. Um, so the new housing design is an improvement on the traditional vernacular. Uh, so it increases the traditional one-story dwelling to two um, to make use of a series of sun spaces which can trap and then circulate heat. Um, and also this helps to increase indoor daylighting levels too um, and also helps to uh, better encourage that flow of natural vent ventilation. Uh, and this project actually has a series of environment, environmental, social, and economic achievements um, because not only does it establish a new model uh, for the rural population, which can be considered as modern, um, but is still connected to those local and traditional routes. Um, but also this format uh, makes use of the local topography, so it reduces materials overall by building into the hillside. Um, it doesn't infringe upon uh, the rural farmers' land, like the concrete flats were doing, uh, and the overall costs were reduced both through that kind of more efficient materiality and through the actual environmental efficiency of the buildings. So that's just an example. Obviously, things like the cave dwellings can't always be applied uh, when looking at, uh, for example, those urbanised areas, but what we try and emphasize uh, through our work um, is the idea that these technologies uh, within vernacular examples could still be applied in some form um, to contemporary problems. Um, so we have a series of ways in which we try and spread information. Uh, we have a weekly article which Tanya produces called uh, The Weekly Shout. And uh, this is where we talk about um, kind of events which are coming up, uh, different architects uh, around the world who often go uh, unrecognised for their achievements. Um, and also, as Tony mentioned, Tasha has been working really closely with the Library at Bath to incre uh, increase the diversity um, of resources accessible to the students. Uh, and then, of course, that is, um, Flora and Mohit uh, regularly release um, these different kinds of posts. So in the spotlight posts feature again, these kind of lesser known, lesser known but accomplished BAME architects um, who are often overlooked. Uh, we try and release information posts about how people can decolonize 
uh, their courses and uh, the teachings at their own schools. And then Tech Tuesdays, which rel relates most closely uh, to what we've been talking about today. And essentially, uh, it's a short series of posts which feature a different construction method uh, from around the globe each week. And it's aiming to emphasize um, both the simplicity and the efficiency of these techniques and uh, hopefully encourage people to adopt them in their own designs uh, when appropriate, uh, rather than just adding solar panels onto the facade. Thank you very much for listening um, and I hope you've enjoyed. What an informative presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya and Jasmine. That was really, really insightful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Zafir now, who's going to give an introduction to the other um, thematic working groups at ACAN. So, yes, yeah, so I guess the next part, as we kind of call this part three, was just to kind of give a quick overview uh, to the ACAN thematic groups, because we are conscious that there are a lot of students in this chat and quite a lot of which will be graduating. So we thought it might be a good opportunity to um, yeah, to share kind of what's going on in ACAN and kind of to go through the like nine thematic groups that Megan alluded to earlier. Um, and I guess it's also a good time now to mention that there are loads of ACAN events happening simultaneously. There's I think four happening today. So uh, some of the coordinators couldn't make it today and they send their apologies, but we have um, this presentation of slides, which will kind of go through what uh, groups are doing. And yeah, some of the coordinators are uh, in fact here today. So I'll pass over to them um, to, yeah, to speak about what they've been up to. Uh, and I'll just really quickly now, I guess, share a link to um, WhatsApp joining links. So each of these nine thematic groups kind of has uh, their own WhatsApp and their own way of communicating, and they all have various campaigns that they action. So in the link that I just sent, it's like a document with, um, yeah, the joining links for each of these groups. So as you hear the presentations, uh, feel free to join any of the chats if any of these um, speak to you. So I guess first is uh, circular economy. And for those of you who maybe don't know already, they've uh, been doing a great job on their circular series, which has uh, come to an end recently. Um, they, took, they took a look at uh, all the RIBA stages from zero to seven and run an, ran an event um, with various speakers and discussions uh, talking about how, yeah, uh, circular economy could be adopted at various stages. And they even had the proposed stage eight. Uh, and it was yeah extremely successful there were hundreds if not thousands of participants in total from the uk and abroad and they're all available on youtube so that's another link i will uh share with you for anybody who wants to check those out there's a playlist uh on the acan website which kind of yeah takes you through all of the events um and yeah they've done some really incredible stuff and next i guess i also did maybe a bit about education i guess most of you will maybe realize that Stucan is part of the education group but the education group is quite large and we do quite a lot of um, activities because we're made up of both students and tutors um, so some of the stuff that we do is we have like a few task forces so we have one that kind of deals with the ARB RIBA uh, we do like consultations for things like um, responses to changes in the curriculum or like mandatory competencies, uh, which will be, I think, discussed later as well. Um, I've also run a series of tutors workshops, both over the summer and Easter, and we're hoping to run some more this summer. We've like uh, potentially going to do one on the 7th of uh, July as well to like start off the summer series for this year. Um, that's two kind of courses why we're here today, which is another thing that the education group does. Um, we're also involved in Arc for Change as part of an advisory board for uh, Sophie Pearls Maker to kind of implement this kind of, this kind of climate uh, curriculum change across like a broader scope of just the uh, UK and we also did work for the climate curriculum uh, over the past year where we created a toolkit to send to both student and staff uh, in ways that they can kind of um, yeah make change at their institution both at a small and large scale uh, and onto embodied carbon who also sadly couldn't join today so they've also done a fantastic job uh, on their recent regulate embodied carbon campaign uh, and they've also got on the website um, linked to a petition, which some of you have probably seen already in a detailed report, uh, which I can also share with you. Um, but yeah, they've also been doing lots of activities, preparing a briefing note for local authorities um, and actions that you can take right now and kind of combating the long term, uh, the long times that are needed for change and kind of taking that at a local level. And uh, they also responded recently to the um, Environmental Audit Committee's call for evidence on uh, yeah, tackling the climate emergency from the built environment. Uh, existing buildings have also got uh, lots going on, uh, particularly relating to the retrofit of our buildings. Uh, they recently been doing a household declare uh, campaign, which is kind of asking households and public to make a series of pledges. 
uh, another really exciting thing that they'd be working on is a TV show pitch, uh, which is actually being discussed with producers at the moment to kind of increase awareness of um, home improvements and where people are putting their money when they do kind of renovations and how they can kind of uh, improve that. Uh, and many of you maybe also saw that uh, that recently they did a domestic retrofit event uh, on the 10th, so actually yeah, just a week ago. Um, uh, and that event, I think, was recorded as well, so that will also be on YouTube soon for anybody that missed it. Uh, yeah, and it was an extremely exciting event. Uh, and I guess the last thing that the campaign that they're currently working on is uh, the con uh, conversation uh, planning reform toolkit as kind of like a follow up to the work that Letty is doing um, and the collaboration with some groups such as Heritage Declares. And then, uh, yeah, also some work on uh, ecological regeneration. Uh, and I think Jana is here to talk about natural materials. Yeah, the natural materials group um, is quite a new group and we just launched in April 20 or well, this year um, with the aim to provide concise and clear information to easily enable natural materials to be the first choice in mainstream construction. Um, can I go next slide, please? Um, yeah, so we've got a little selection of some materials here. Um, we've been working through the definition of what natural materials actually are. Um, so there's there's still some some work establishing the group, but we've also jumped straight into some some actions. Um, can you go next slide, please? So what we're basically what we're planning to do as a group um, is to collate and add to existing resources. We know there's a lot out there already, but we want to kind of um, assess it, fill in the gaps and then reformat for um, different user groups so it's really nice and clear um, and comparable and effectively that means producing standard details um, that are that, that use natural materials. Uh, next slide please. And how we've done that is to um, split up into a few subgroups because there's quite a lot of us um, already which is very exciting. Um, so we've kind of got the, this gather, collate and disseminate um, subgroup um, format. And at the moment, the, the gather group, we are, we're creating a survey which um, will go out to those in the industry um, to find out what resources are needed and what people already use, um, which will really form the basis of a, a thorough um, body of research really. We're also, um, the Collate Group are also collaborating with Architects Declare on a materials database, which is um, building, a, a, the, I guess, a thorough resource, but we're then taking that further to do um, sets of standard details. And we are launching an event um, series for the year. We've been kind of inspired by the uh, Circular Economy Group um, and want to do something quite similar, but for um, yeah, different ways of, of using natural materials and getting information out there. Next slide, please. Um, we also had some spin-off like immediate actions and this was in May, we um, quickly put together a response for the Environmental Audit Committee um, inquiry, so um, that was a really good first action that we got done. Um, and with that we also made a, a small survey for businesses in the industry to find out again some more issues and gather data. Next slide please. So this is um, where we're up to at the moment, we are creating lists of resources and, and working on surveys and we are launching our first event which is going to be the 1st of July at 7pm. This is actually the first time we've said that uh, live so this is um, very exciting to announce it. Um, so I hope to see lots of you there. Thanks. Thanks a lot Jenna. Uh, and next is planning policy. So Sally also can um, be here today, but planning policy will be doing lots of work supporting uh, the work of existing buildings uh, and also working on a toolkit for councils to, uh, yeah, to link the conservation areas uh, and also kind of working with the retrofit work um, of the existing buildings group and yeah, also supporting the Letty retrofit guide and are currently doing a call out for um, planning cases. Uh, and professional standards is another one of the groups uh, that ACAN has and I guess maybe one of the first actions that ACAN did was um, when ACAN went to the ARB to kind of defend Tom Bennett and the right to protest. Um, so this is them all <laughs> outside uh, and yeah so much of the work that professional standards group does is kind of deal with uh, organisations like the RIBA and ARB uh, and ensure that they're focusing on tackling the climate emergency. 
and I guess similar to what was um, discussed earlier about the education group, there is actually an RIA consultation at the moment with the deadline of tomorrow uh, about the mandatory competencies, which are kind of focusing on the three areas of health and safety, climate literacy, um, and ethical practice. And of course, we will be doing a response kind of focused on the climate literacy uh, aspect, but this is, um, yeah, something that the group is working on. I can share uh, a link to the response for any of you. And I'd encourage all of you, even if you're students, to have a look and uh, yeah, get your responses in. And next is where the wild things aren't. And Rachel, I believe, is here to present. So Hello, to hi, Rachel. can you hear me? Yes, um, hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fairly newbie coordinator for where, where the wild things aren't. And um, we are sort of interested in all things nature and biodiverse and um, sort of highlighting the importance of biodiversity and how the built environment can connect with nature and nature-based solutions. Um, so we're doing a lot of sort of work into our core language and our aims and outcomes at the moment. And we've sort of set up these three titles. Um, so firstly to embrace, and these are things that we want to do and we'd like to see happening more in the built environment, but um, the first is embrace ecosystems. And so we'd like to advocate for the critical importance of biodiversity and ecosystems to our survival and resilience. Um, and we want to embrace species diversity within design, remembering that we're only one species in a much wider um, system that needs to be incorporated everywhere. So we want to mainstream knowledge of the opportunity and value in nature-based solutions. So this is all about education and how we can sort of um, positively affect um, how we learn about ecology and things in, our, in architecture and in the built environment. Um, so the second one is institutional influence. So this is all about legislation um, and we want to um, stimulate political will for systematic change to legislative frameworks um, that put protection and recovery of biodiversity and ecosystems at the heart of decision making at every scale. So this involves um, submissions or um, um, open letters, some of which I sort of can mention that we've done already. And then um, connected custodians is our last one. So this is sort of a cultural change. Um, and we want to be um, guided both by local knowledge and the principles of stewardship, conservation and um, regeneration to establish deep connectedness with natural ecosystems and become good ancestors. So that's our sort of cultural change. And we really um, sort of would like an interdis interdisciplinary approach. And we're sort of looking at partnerships with um, groups outside of the built environment, you know, sort of environmental groups and working with them. Um, and we also want to make sure that um, ecological thought and um, the importance of biodiversity is sort of implemented across all ACAN thematic groups. We sort of think that we come into every possible group. So we're looking to work with them um, all different ACAN thematic groups as well. If you could just move on to the next slide. So these are just a few things that we've done so far. Um, we've um, put out an open letter and responded to the England um, tree strategy response. As some other groups have suggested, we also set, um, set a, our own submission for the Environmental Audit Committee. Um, and one thing that we're looking to do is um, respond to the Dasgupta review, which um, if you've not heard about this, it's a sort of government um, instigated but independent global review um, to the economics of biodiversity. Our economic system currently exists outside of nature. And this is a really important document that sort of says actually, economic success is embedded in nature and you need to think about it so we think this is a really sort of pivotal time for our group to really respond to this and use this and create some events based around um the dust group to review so we encourage any new members that have an interest in um nature even if you don't know anything about it um and ecological solutions um landscape architects architects anybody just sort of come and join our whatsapp um listen to the conversations, just have a, have a look and see what they are to start with and then get as involved or as uninvolved as you want to be. So join us. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rachel. Uh, and I believe we have Scott uh, who came straight from another event. So extra shout out to Scott for that, uh, to talk about carbon literacy. Over to you, Scott. All right, cheers. Thanks for having us. So yeah, carbon literacy is a working group really focused around uh, kind of facilitating the upscaling we know that we all need. We know the education we've had so far has not prepared all of us to design zero carbon buildings. 
and there's a lot of knowledge to share. So part of that cultural transformation that ACAM's can looking for is really about sharing and challenging that. So what Carbon Literacy really does is learn from each of the other thematic groups and kind of ch channel that as well. So the diagram on the left hand side is kind of taking all the learning, the expertise, the resources from other working groups and finding the best places to channel them towards. So that's just the kind of roughly whereabouts they are as well. So can we go to the next slides as well? So with the group, it's, there's no kind of uh, barrier to entry. There's no minimum threshold of knowledge. You don't need a certification or a fancy sticker or badge. It's just if you have energy and enthusiasm and you really want to learn, then you're beyond welcome. And we're also looking for another coordinator or two because I could really, really use a hand. That would be absolutely fantastic. So in the near future, we're looking at uh, curating and hosting a series of events very similar to the kind of circular economy events, but building this around the impending mandatory competencies that the RIBA have been, are bringing in in the next couple of years. But especially with this, we really want to learn from people out with the kind of traditional architectural bubble, bubble and roster of sustainability professionals. We want to make that as broad as possible. At the same time, we want to try and have more kind of opportunities to just be social and to learn from other people, whether that be via Zoom or via people that you're nearby as well. And we're also really keen to get the working group's first ever campaign rolling. So if you've got lots of energy and want to get to feed into a campaign and shape it and really kind of put that the, the knowledge that we're trying to gather and work on that cultural transformation, then we would absolutely love to have you. And I think the WhatsApp group link is being shared. I kind of hope so. I've not copied and pasted it yet, but that's sort of whereabouts we are. So thank you very much for having me. I hope that was all right. That was great. Thank you so much. I will stop sharing screen so we can all just uh, go back to our cameras on. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much to all the coordinators who presented. I will um, yeah hand back to Megan as we have a few minutes to go through any questions uh, from the audience if anybody wants to ask anything. Yeah, thanks, Sophia. Um, yeah, and thank you to everyone who's presented this evening and for all of the coordinators for coming along. Um, it's been incredibly helpful. And yeah, hopefully we have some new graduates and students appearing across the board in some of the other thematic groups. That'd be amazing. Um, yeah, we've got a little bit of time now, um, 10 minutes or so, just before we round up um, for any questions. So um, if anyone in the audience has questions for Helen, Vinny or uh, Ellie from the student groups, and then uh, Ella from You Tell Me Collective and Tanya and Jasmine from Decolonize Architecture, um, massive thank you for all of your insightful presentations. And yeah, now is the time to ask questions. Feel free to post them in the chat or equally you can pop your camera on and yeah, just ask. Oh yeah, Megan, is it okay if I go first and ask a question? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, Helen, I was just wondering if you could just talk a bit more about the, um, the tutor sessions that you did. And um, I think Scott was part of that as well. So yeah, if you could just maybe expand on that, that'd be really cool to hear about. Um, yeah, it was... Um... It was like probably a month or two ago now and yeah we kind of just organized it so that we had speakers and then a, um, a breakout session where we told the participants to um, organize a question from their group from their breakout groups and then ask them to the speakers at, at the end of that session and um, so that you kind of had time to discuss with your peers and like form a question and not feel like you're you're asking the pressure of asking in front of a massive audi audience um, and yeah, it worked out quite well and a lot of people said they really, really liked it. Um, and yeah, Scott was our first speaker um, and obviously loads of people had loads of questions for him. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a success and our, yeah, our report we'll probably share with you actually once we've finalised it and um, like formatted all of our results. But yeah, that should be coming soon as well. I'll jump in uh, with a question for, for Sheffield. Um, I know we have a couple of Sheffield members in the audience. Um, yeah, it's amazing that you guys have managed to set up a podcast. Um, and as one of the more established groups, um, I wonder whether any of the newly formed groups would like to hear sort of the logistics of how you set it up and sort of how you run it. Um, I guess how you organise who's going to speak and, and all of that sort of stuff, if you wouldn't mind just breezing over it. Uh, yeah, so... I can see Marion's here. I don't know if you want to take this one um, as head of the podcast team. Would that be okay? Yeah, that's fine. Um, thank you. 
Um, so basically, the podcast, I would say, started, it was like one of the last things that the group kind of decided to do. Um, and it, it just started off as a way to just kind of have informal conversations about you know, the things that we're all thinking, basically. Um, and so the first um, episode um, was um, one of the professors at the um, University of Sheffield, Pian Stevenson. I think she's also part of the ACAN group. And that was just kind of like to give um, a kind of broad overview of what sustainability means in education and just as a kind of intro. And then on the second episode, we had Scott, um, which is also really good, was talking about um, activism and architectural education. Um, so at the moment, we're, we're kind of just trying to build almost like a kind of story, kind of giving the foundations of what um, we, we, we kind of want to be talking about. And now we're also kind of moving into speaking to students. Um, so we've recently just spoken to the part one winner of the um, RIBA award for sustainability um, for last year. And just, it was just kind of talking through her project and kind of giving advice to um, students um, that are currently like in education and stuff. Um, so I think it's just kind of a way to just have a more kind of formal conversation that people we might, that we might not necessarily have at events or um, things like that. But um, in terms of choosing who we actually speak to, it's mostly just kind of discussions within the group. Um, if anyone kind of finds someone interesting that we like to hear from, we kind of chat through it in the group and then just email them. It's been a bit tricky in the last year, just kind of getting people to talk to because everyone's just been busy for a lot of things. Um, so yeah, I guess that's kind of picking up a little bit now, hopefully. Thanks, Mary. That's really great to hear. Um, we've had a question in the chat from Wendy, and I guess this one is best directed at Tanya or Jasmine. Um, she's wondering if uh, there's a similar network for decolonizing the curriculum. It would be great to be able to share the great work everyone is doing and to get some momentum nationally. Uh, no, I was going to say, Tanya, do you want to say this one? <laughs> um, so I would say that um, in terms of our own group, we do have an external outreach um, we like to collaborate with um, other student groups as well as practices um, to form kind of more of a working relationship as well as the newsletter being um, to external subscribers so that anyone can respond and kind of form that um, open uh, channel of communication. But um, more nationally, there's also the NUS um, decolonizing network. Um, and on there, I've just shared a link. They have a map of different decolonizing education groups um, that um, is quite insightful and helpful to see kind of what's going on around the country. Um, so I would definitely kind of look at that as a tool to contact other people. Great. Thanks, Tanya. That's good to know. And uh, I see you popped a link in the chat there as well. So for anyone who wants to check that out, that's, yeah, that's going to be really helpful. Another message in the chat I see from Scott um, saying that the organisation of the, the format of the events that were happening at Westminster was great from a speaker's perspective as well. So that's quite a nice takeaway for uh, other university groups who are thinking about doing something similar. Um, a great way to explore, um, yeah, the question, questions and answers. So that was, yeah, really good. Um, do we have any more questions? I know that we only, we're sort of running out of time. So before we wrap up, it would be good to squeeze one more in. No problem. We're shy this evening. Um, cool. Well, we'll wrap up there. Um, and yeah, just want to extend a massive thank you to all of our speakers again for coming along, the existing student groups, uh, You Tell Me Collective and Decolonize Architecture. Um, and all of the links have been posted in the chat um, for you to be able to, to reach them on their own platforms. Um, Sophia, I can see, has just posted a link into the chat for the Hope in Action, our virtual pub. Um, so we're going to close the event here now and go and, yeah, just virtually toast all of you for your hard work for this event and over the course of this academic year. <laughs>